Lord. I guess I, I am. <laughs> All right. I think, I think we're live. And uh, hello. And it's Friday, hello. April 19th, 2019, 1 o'clock Eastern Time. And this is High Ed Live Special Edition. I'm your host, Serge Sitch, Vice President for Enrollment Careers and Alumni Programs at Central, uh, Central European University in Budapest, Hungary. It's 7 p.m. Central Eastern European time, by the way. Today we're talking about career trajectories and global trends in higher education advancement. And above all, I'm looking forward to sharing fascinating stories of wonderful three guests, distinguished guests, to be interest, introduced in a minute. But for now, just a few words about the teams behind the show. The special edition is part of the High Ed Life Network. All of these episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. And you can also be part of this live broadcast by sharing your knowledge, of course. Participate in today's discussion by tweeting us using hashtag High Ed Life. Today's live broadcast is powered by Platform Q Education Content Online Engagement Platform. To learn how to integrate continuous online engagement into your marketing and enrollment plans using Conduit, visit platform qedu.com. All of our episodes are recorded. They're free, easy to access in the video archives at highedlife.com or take High Ed Life with you on the go by subscribing to the podcast. And High Ed Life is produced by M. Stoner, a digital-first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. Two rows of navigation, a carousel, three news items, three events, some alumni profiles, a social media aggregator, and a fat footer. Look familiar? Don't fall into the high ed website sea of same. The upcoming and free high ed website M Stoner webinar on Wednesday, April 24 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time is for you will arm you with the tools you need to make your next website redesign, starting with your homepage, distinct and compelling. We'll be tweeting our link to the registration page shortly. And with this important information shared, um, let me um, start conversation with our guests, whom you would be probably surprised, and that might be unique for High Ed Life, cover if you will, more than 100 years of professional service in or for higher education. And I'm sure many of you had a chance to read online bios of our distinguished guests on last, online, but let me briefly introduce them and add my own line on they, I call it superpowers, as my own professional influencers. Let me start with Zarema. And Zarema Kasabiva is Vice Rector for Strategic Enrollment, Management, Student Affairs and Alumni Relations at the New Economic School in Moscow, Russian Federation. Now, I met Zarema some time ago at one of the conferences or workshops. And since that moment, I don't know, 10 years ago, I've seen her, her and a lot of her team members coming to various tr professional training functions uh, all over the world, truly. And... Um, so for me, Zarema, and I actually had an interview with her for my doctoral research in professional identities. So for me, Zarema is one of the few people that I met that continuously looking into meaning of her profession, that looking for search, uh, for searching for meaning in the professional development, and constantly inspires herself and others to achieve new things. And this has been um, a truly tremendous pleasure to have known her because I learned from her how to stay motivated. So it's good to have you with us, Zarema. It's really a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, thank you so thank much you. for joining. Now, the next person that I would like to introduce is Andy Shandley. And Andy is Vice President for Alumni Relations at Brown University and the founder of very unique and one of its kind Alumni Futures blog. Now, I met Andy also many years ago at one of the conferences, and he's, he's going beyond obvious. He's going so deep and so wide and looking at the horizon. And, uh, you know, on a few occasions, I was also, you know, looking for some quite basic answers for my own uh, programming questions. And I was surprised that Andy has this range from, you know, universe and future 
of alumni and beyond to very specific details on any programming element that I had uh, in the past. And this sheer, you know, um, you know, scope of what Andy can can talk about and think about is 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 tremendous. So I really am excited to have Andy today on the show and has been inspired by his deep interest in learning about this profession. Thank you for having for being with us on the show, Andy. Thank you very much, Serge. Thank you. And then Dr. Phil Conroy was asked today, uh, who is international recognized expert chair and co-founder of Alumni Relations Expert Community of the European Association for International Education, and he's senior independent consultant. Um, Phil has had a lot of hats from director of professional area and teaching roles to president the college of a pres uh, president's college, but his main superpower for me and I met him probably around 20 years ago, um, has been taking very complex issues and putting them in one very simple, digestible, and relevant to many professionals line. He's a master storyteller, and you would not be surprised, he has been my mentor since we met. So I, I, it's a pleasure and an honor to have uh, Dr. Phil Conroy with us today. Thank you for joining us, Phil. It's a pleasure to be here, Jasper. Thank you. Now, uh, without any due kind of remarks, I'm you guys. We have only just less than an hour to talk about stuff. Um, if you could shortly comment, so let's say within three minutes each, about your career highlights and journey, and I know it's impossible, but I would just ask you to focus on two elements. One is your point of entry, how you end up within higher educational field, whether it was a professional role or teaching role. And I will tell you, as, and then what is your current affiliation? And if you would see a teenager and you would have a chat with a teenager today, and this teenager would ask you, what do you do for life? What would be your simple um, and probably deep enough answer? And as far as the entry point in your role is concerned, um, it, you know, I call myself accidental professional, and many of you know that I ended up doing what I do. Certainly, I ended my, I started my career in alumni relations uh, by simple need to have uh, medical insurance for my family. I just had to work, and the, the closest job I had was a job with the alumni relations coordinator title, and I had to check in the dictionary what alumni meant. And whatever it would mean, actually, I was ready to take it and apply and, you know, hard press for it. You know, I, I was lucky to get into the job of my life, but I do treat myself to be accidental professional. And I would be curious about your point of entry. Too. So if if possible, Phil, let's start with you, your entry in higher education field and where are you now? So uh, my journey has been quite, quite long. Um, I was the first uh, student at my undergraduate college to be invited to be a member of the Alumni Association Executive Board. So that was my introduction to alumni relations. Um, I had decided that I wanted to be a teacher. So, uh, and that is how I still describe myself is, is a teacher. So I did teach uh, in uh, elementary schools for a while. And then I was invited back on the faculty at my undergraduate institution. And uh, with my interest in alumni relations, it became sort of natural for me to move from a faculty position to an alumni relations position. So I guess um, it was accidental in that um, it was time for us to have a full-time professional position. Um, and, and that's how I got involved in alumni relations. I didn't particularly stay in that area. I went on to fundraising and development uh, at my alma mater and then went on to um, the big university in our state, Massachusetts, uh, University of Massachusetts, and was there for a while. And then I went to a very small independent college just outside of Boston, Mount Ida College, where I was the vice president for advancement. And then I was asked to take on the role uh, as the vice president for enrollment management. Um, and. Uh, Way back, I had decided that it might be nice one day to become a college president. And I probably was 30 years old at the time. And um, I sort of set that as a goal, but not one that I had put on a strong tra trajectory because I was not coming up 
On the academic side of the House, I was coming up on the administrative or what I call the revenue producing side of the House, uh, alumni fundraising and enrollment management. And um, along the way, some folks recognized that I might have the potential to be a president, so they started to nominate me for positions. And I wound up being the finalist or the person that didn't get the job five times before I got the job. So I became college president at Vermont Technical College, which is the public polytechnic institution in the state of Vermont. So my trajectory in higher ed was I always knew that I wanted to teach. I always knew I wanted to be in higher education. And I do enjoy teaching through the administrative side and, um, and working with institutions that way. Thank you, Phil. That's a fascinating story. Um, Zarema, would you like to continue and tell us how you started and where you now? I would like to to say about uh, to comment on my entry uh, to new economic school and to high education of uh, modern type of uh, actually world wide recognized. Uh, institution which was started in 92 back in 92 in russia and i was invited uh, just uh, by the director of uh, research institute of russian academy of science uh, academician uh, valery makarov uh, and alexander friedman professor just to help with the first admission campaign uh, mm -hmm. with i don't i i didn't understand didn't recognize what kind of uh, new project we uh, we launched, yeah? So I helped with the first um, um, admission campaign. Uh, actually, uh, we uh, have usually admission campaign in uh, uh, July, August. We, I mean, in Russia. And in, in June, um, I, I uh, was a manager uh, with the first uh, group of... Uh, Mm, with the first group of managers to take them to five universities of Australia. So it's also my introduction to international uh, kind of uh, higher education life. Mm -hmm. mm, and during uh, June, I um, visited uh, the sequence of Australian universities. And then I came to NES and um, I was... Uh, Mm, invited to take my first uh, job at New Economic School as Dean of Students. I think I was the first Dean of Students in Russia. Uh, our project now is not project, it's uh, 26 years of uh, the best institution in Russia which uh, teaches uh, and made research uh, uh, of high standards, uh, high international standards, um, not only in Russia, but through all the world. And during my position as a, a dean of students, I, I was involved in admission, in student affairs, uh, in uh, retention of students, then with alumni. And I decided that it's very important to take care and to be in, in touch with the alumni of the first year. Uh, so we created the database of alumni, uh, uh, we have a strong association of alumni, um, and I continue my work in, uh, in higher ed and teaching and making research. Uh, my uh, dissertation was um, um, devoted to the uh, modern uh, instruments and methods of management in uh, uh, corporatization and marketization of uh, higher education. Very, very special thing yeah, uh, in the uh, academic world. And I would say that uh, really I discovered the whole world of uh, research and whole world of uh, professional um, people in higher ed, uh, such as and Phil and Andy and, and Serge, of course. And it started with my um, with my talk with Rosica Batison, 
Uh, she was then a vice president, I think, of Central European University. Correct. Uh, which uh, he, she told me about uh, potential of research, of really research in higher education. And I discovered that really my heart is here, not in economics. My uh, master degree or undergraduate degree was uh, in economics, but with high education management and administration. And then I um, uh, did a lot of, lot of other work. Uh, so currently, uh, having, lo ha having launched already the first and the most uh, successful uh, fundraising campaign Elanga Lamni in Russia. Um, uh, the, my, my, how to say, um, uh, my responsibility covers uh, all the strategic enrollment management uh, uh, loop, I would say, from potential uh, applicants, from prospects to students, uh, uh, internal marketing, alumni, fundraising, uh, career services, uh, uh, parents, and the game. Thank Excellent. you. Yeah, thank you. It's a, a truly full point, you know, journey. Um, thank you, Zadim. Andy. So um, thank you, Serge. Uh, I just want to say, I give a shout out before I start that I'm traveling right now for business and I'm in Portland, Oregon, uh, several thousand miles from my, my home campus. And uh, I was lucky enough to be hosted today by the uh, Oregon State University Foundation offices in Portland. And that's what you see in the back is some uh, Oregon State University uh, swag. So thank you to them for allowing me to use their conference room and their internet. Um, my, um, my entry into higher education was really um, not that intentional. I had previously been working in a test preparation company that helps high school students prepare for university entrance exams. I liked being in education, but I also liked being on the business or management side, not on the academic side. And um, I contacted my own university, Brown, and asked them if they had job postings or had help for people who were alumni to help them find jobs or to change careers. And um, they said, well, what kind of a career are you interested in? And I said, well, maybe something in education, but something that's in an office, like managerial. And they said, well, why don't you work at Brown? We have, <laughs> we have jobs in the alumni office. Um, and you know, I thought, why not? Um, and, uh, you know, I know the institution, uh, I had graduated from here three years before, um, and, um, and I applied for the job and, um, eventually I ended up, I didn't get the first job that I applied for, but I did eventually get recruited for a different position, um, and, uh, accepted that role and, and joined the alumni office at Brown in, uh, now more than 30 years ago, 1989, working with professors mostly and sending them to alumni clubs and chapters um, in different geographic locations to provide educational programs for graduates of, of the university. Um, you, you know, I think you asked what was sort of the big sort of uh, uh, event or uh, milestone. Uh, I would say that it was after seven plus years of working at my own institution where I was a student to leave there and go to work in the alumni office of a university with which I had no personal history or connection. Uh, uh, I went to work at the University of Michigan, and it was now uh, clear, I think, looking back, that that was a point in the mid-1990s when alumni relations as a profession changed somewhat from being something you did at your own university, because you were a, an alumnus, to being something that, if you are an alumnus, that's good, but what's more important is that you have experience or knowledge of the profession itself. And so you could go and be successful in the alumni operation of a university where you yourself were not a graduate. And so, um, you know, from there I went, I worked at, at Michigan for three years. I was the alumni director at the California Institute of Technology in California for over 10 years. I did a little bit of consulting on my own and then went to Carnegie Mellon University. Again, these are all places where I had no personal connection, uh, had never been a student but was recruited because they were looking for someone who had experience in the alumni profession specifically. Um, and then I did more strategy consulting uh, over the last few years 
And what I would say about that is that it's interesting that the idea or concept of alumni now is expanding beyond educational organizations so that you have corporate alumni associations, you have foundations that have um, maybe grant recipients or former employees who they consider alumni, you have uh, associations, organizations, anything with a shared experience now is understood uh, more than ever to be an alumni community potentially. And uh, that opened up a lot of opportunities for strategy consulting, not only in education, in schools and in universities, but also beyond that in other kinds of uh, organizations. And then in December, I had the opportunity to come back where I started my career 30 years ago to come back to Brown as the senior person for alumni. Uh, and I, I started that in December. Um, and uh, th the other thing you asked was, you know, what, what we would say to a, to a student, I think, yes, you know, about what we, what, what we do. Um, I, I always listen to the way people answer that question, what do you do? Because some people give their job title. You know, I could say I'm, I'm the vice president for alumni relations, um, which technically is true, but it doesn't say much about what I actually accomplish. Um, right. You know, I, I would say from a descriptive standpoint, I would say that, uh, you know, my job is to connect people with their university in ways that those people find relevant and meaningful and that also help the university do what it's in business to accomplish. Um, that, that's what I think our job is. Great definition of um, alumni profession and wonderful um, stories. And, uh, you know, yeah. early on, I promised to have, um, you know, whole programs dedicated to each of you guys. But listen, now, as we're talking about this element of uh, for how long you span at each institution, let me throw in um, a Twitter question that comes early on. Um, usually we kind of postpone them till the end of the program, but let, just to be relevant and in the flow of what Andy was saying. So there was a question on Twitter saying something, the per, a person is in a hiring position and you are all senior enough to do a lot of hiring and hopefully not at all firing, right? Just hiring. And then when you hire, and we all four of us have different trajectories, Zarema and myself are competing, you know, who will stay longer at one institution. And Phil and Andy, you have had you know, uh, time spent at each institution, though, of course, roles would be various. So now each of you, in each of your kind of cosmos, in each of your universe, if you will, when you or if you're hiring and the person stays at the same institution for 10 years or more, is it more advantage? Or actually you ask, well, maybe it's that was too much comfort. So whether it's loyalty or comfort and how you would distinguish and whether there is any difference between a lot of time at one institution and a lot of time at one position. If you could feel start uh, circle, um, I would be appreciated. Sure. Um, uh, well, I, I spent, uh, in the four institutions that I worked for, I spent um, 18 years at Bridgewater State, my alma mater. But during that 18 years, I had five different jobs. Right. So it wasn't that I was there doing the same thing for that length of time. The same at Mount Ida where I was for, there for 14 years. I had two different vice presidencies. So to me, I, I loved being at an institution for a long period of time because you got to see the whole life cycle of the institution. So the way, the way I used to describe it is um, if you caused a problem, then you were also there long enough to solve the problem. <laughs> a lot of times, I think, when you move from one institution to another institution in relatively short periods of time, you've got people who come in who are then going to try to fix what might have not been working rather than have some kind of continuity. I think you need two type, both types of people. I think you need the people who are moving, but I also think you need the people that form the foundation for the institution. Um, one of the things I always also say is that um, the history of the institution does not start when I arrive. There's a history of the institution that goes back for generations, and you have to be respectful of that. And folks that tend to be in institutions for long periods of time, they're the keepers of that, that history. And as you come from the outside and you start to join that institution, then you learn what makes that organization thrive and makes it unique so that, as Andy says, you can help develop that unique 
uh, relationship that alumni, you want alumni to have with their institution that's relevant for them. Thank you, Phil. Zanema, your take on what do you do with people staying too long or too short period of time with one employer? Uh, you know, I am a veteran. I'm dinosaur, I think. And I, I hope that I will not, uh, how do I say, mm, die, you know? <laughs> be <laughs> You will die one day, probably. No, no, of course, but I will not be Iskapayama, you know? I don't know yeah, yeah. Uh, this word, in, but I think you understand me, yeah. Yes. I'm with my institution from the first day so it's uh, 26 years already, mm -hmm. yeah? And it's uh, sometimes it's not fun. I love my work very much. And I, wor I love my place of my uh, uh, work, yeah? But it's not really my only job. It's my destiny, it's my, it's my passion, it's my uh, love, it's my life, it's my family, it's my challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, I learned a lot, a lot during this um, uh, period. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as uh, Phil mentioned, that the whole life cycles, it's uh, the whole life cycle of uh, uh, academic year. It's uh, usually, you know, it's repetition and repetition in some, in some sense. But uh, um, for me, it's not repetition. It's something new. It's really mm -hmm. challenge and challenging. Uh, for example, today we meet with the um, uh, class of uh, 2019 uh, to talk with them about uh, associ alumni association, uh, how to be a member of that, and what benefits, what privileges. Uh, but uh, then we just talked to uh, about two hours about um, strong, uh, like SWOT analysis, you know, uh, um, spontaneous SWOT analysis of what we're doing uh, uh, here at New Economic School. We discuss strengths and uh, weaknesses, uh, threats and opportunities. And it's so interesting when I talk with these young people who are just in a two months, in two months, they they already are alumni. No, as I used to say, uh, tell them uh, at the first orientation sessions, okay, you, you just, according to the um, uh, academic heritage uh, um, vocabulary, you're already alumni, you know, it depends how we define them. Uh, so for me, it's interesting. It's uh, the, motiva the motivation of my life uh, to be at NES. Uh, sometimes my uh, alum, alums ask me, not do, how to say, not I'm boring with this place and with work. No, you know, uh, it's really very interesting. And developing new kind of institution with, in, in Russia with international standards, with uh, alumni relations, by the way, and we, we Ness, uh, and me myself pioneered alumni relation as a profession here, you know, and a lot of uh, other institutions now, universities, um, the administrators uh, uh, come to us uh, to learn how, uh, how to establish and how to develop this uh, profession and this kind of uh, uh, administrative work. Uh, at other universities in Russia. I see. That's a great answer. And your take on staying too long, too short. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it reminds me of the joke, you know, where this the, the, the person is talking with somebody about one of their employees, and they say, you know, has that person been here 10 yeah, That person has 10 years of experience. And the other person says, no, they have the same year 10 times. Um, <laughs> so... So, you know, what you, what you need to avoid is having people who have the same year of experience and never go beyond that, who only do one job. Um, you know, Phil's point about changing roles, whether it's early in your career or as a very senior person, I think is what really matters. So I, I don't think it's good or bad necessarily if someone's a long time or not a long time in one place. What's bad is if they don't um, have the opportunity or the mandate or the obligation to 
find uh, other resources, new ideas, exposure to different kinds of environments, stories or methods that come from different institutions, not only other universities, but from the private sector, from firms or from government or from different kinds of nonprofit organizations, so that you can apply those to what you do. And that makes each year new, even though your job or your role officially hasn't changed. What matters is not the role. What matters is what you bring to the role and how you do it. And I think that uh, making sure there is outside influence and uh, new um, sources of information is, is what makes you successful. Got it. Now, talking about outside influences, if we can briefly kind of scan such a thing as uh, informal knowledge transfer, you know, it considered to be an important role in our professional development and lives. Did you have any mentor, perhaps colleague, or someone in general who either criticized you or you know supported you throughout your career, which played a role in somehow affected who you are now? And if the answer is no, this is also a very good answer because you know it's one angle, it's just one point of reference, like how we evolve. So if we can continue with with Phil about someone's being a mentor or advisor or maybe critique you know, someone who was criticizing you, which made an impact on who you are now? Uh, I had a wonderful <laughs> set of um, mentors throughout my, my career, uh, and they shifted as I needed different types of uh, mentors. But the, 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 I would say that the foundation of those mentors <laughs> is actually at my undergraduate college, Bridgewater State. Uh, there were some incredible faculty and administrators there. We were a relatively small institution at the time. We were less than, uh, less than uh, 2,100 students. So you, you, you had the opportunity to really get to know folks. I remember one uh, professor in particular, his name is Bob Barnett. And Bob was a communications professor. And um, he taught a course called uh, Creative Problem Solving. And he what he wanted people to uh, students to understand, and most of us were first generation college, first in our families to go to college. He wanted us to understand that the limitations that we would have in our careers were going to be self-imposed. They were not going to be from somebody else. They were going to be self-imposed. And what he wanted us to do was to give ourselves permission to be great, whatever that means to that individual, to be great. So for me, with that as my foundation, I started to look to see what I could do, how I could contribute back, understanding that greatness was going to be my criteria for success. And I was going to be the, def the definer of what that meant. Each time I, uh, I, I came to um, an organization, I would seek out people who could help me be that person that I wanted to be, be great in that context. It was um, when I wanted to be a vice president, I found uh, a group of vice presidents that would, would help me. When I wanted to be a president, I went to the people who I reported to, who were the presidents, and I asked them how they got there. Now, interestingly, um, three of the presidents, of the four presidents that I worked for were women. And back in the day, it was not usual for uh, women to mentor men. So for me, it was, it was a wonderful experience, but it was, it was a new experience for both of us in that regard. And I, 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 it was the women mentors in my career who really helped me. Now, having said that, um, I have developed a network of incredible people around the world that I, I, I rely on, um, including people who are on this platform today um, to, to help guide. So to me, um, I haven't had a single mentor, but I have had a, the privilege of having a whole group of people who have helped guide me. I think that otherwise it becomes, for me anyway, it would become a very lonely journey um, and I have relished the, uh, the, the relationships that I've had. Uh, and I hope that I have become a good mentor to those people 
in the example of Bob Barnett, for example, who um, was the person for me who really said, you can do whatever you want to do um, and just set your, your, your goals and go after them. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Zarema, did you have, have you had uh, anyone who is influencing your career from outside, mentor, colleague? I would say, uh, uh, yes, no, like Phil mentioned, that not a single person, but mm -hmm. uh, different kind of people in different time, uh, men and women. Uh, first, of course, uh, I'm, I'm lucky um, my mom as a great, uh, um, how to say, example of, of uh, success, in, not in high ed, but in just education in, in Moscow, uh, she influenced uh, very much, yeah, uh, how to behave with people, what's important that how how important it is to do uh, your work uh, um, very good excellence excel to excel in your work but talking about uh, uh, professional people at my school of course it's a set of different professors and different uh, um, uh, top managers uh, uh, leaders at school my school was uh, again was um, established in '92. There were no uh, modern education in economics and finance and and research and modern research in Russia in that time. No po political economy of socialism. I remember myself. I um, was a student, so uh, I don't like. I I didn't like this uh, um, cause at Sorry. all. So this subject, yeah. Uh, so uh, Professor Makarov, the first director of the new economic school, and Professor of uh, Professor Gur Offer from Hebrew University, who initiated uh, uh, new economic school, and who then served as a coordinator, as a leader of international advisory board, uh, which uh, consisted from prominent. Uh, uh, economists all over the world, uh, he himself and this group of uh, uh, devoted, motivated, uh, tenured professor from Harvard, uh, Jerusalem University, uh, Brown, Chicago, uh, top-ranked uh, uh, universities, um, uh, in you on in states or uk or uh, in israel uh, they influence a lot because they it's not saying benchmark but high standards uh how you want to achieve uh, what you want to achieve uh, they showed me that it's uh, it it can be done and it's uh, mm, worth doing only when you excel no. And also, I would love uh, to mention some other people. One of my alums, her name is Katya Zhuravskaya. Uh, last year, she was recognized the best, uh, uh, best uh, wo economist women in Europe. Uh, she influenced on my uh, perceptions of... Uh, this excelling, you know, in uh, uh, life or uh, higher education. Uh, by the way, uh, I remember that one time she asked me, uh, uh, why do you think that alumni relations so important? And I, <laughs> like mentoring to her, to her, you know, explain her why it's so important. And also, um, I would mention that uh, longer time ago, I was lucky to got a fellow, fel um, fellowship from Trust Foundation. Um, and uh, I came to University of Denver. And then it, she was associate professor and uh, vice dean of the Graduate School of International Relations, Professor Karen Festi. 
um, she is a friend of mine now, yeah, but she is life uh, uh, mentor for myself. And it's tricky that uh, she lives in Denver, and several years ago, my daughter moved to Denver, and now not only my mentor, but also part of my family you now no lives uh, at uh, Denver. Uh, and a lot of a lot of other people, and I also so um, thankful, thankful, and so um, so is so important, to valuable meetings uh, with such people as you feel, yeah. Andy, I don't know you personally, yeah, but uh, uh, what uh, Phil uh, have been doing, and Serge, of course, yeah. Um, and the European Association of International um, Education. Educators, uh, yeah, and the group of people there, uh, it's my support, it's an uh, uh, international group of uh, mentors, advisors, and friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zarima. Quite a range of, uh, from alumni to professors, a great story. Andy, your take on people yeah. in your professional life. Yeah. I, I won't I won't list names of, of people, um, but I, I will say that as I thought about this just now, you know, the there is definitely at each institution where I've worked and in each role that I've had, there's been at least one person who was more senior, more experienced, a sort of a resource. You use the phrase informal knowledge transfer, which I think is a interesting because it, it, it's not only that you're learning from people who have more experience or um, more seniority or more knowledge, but also you're learning from your peers, you learn from each other, um, so that um, uh, you know. As as Serge, when you know, when you and I got to know each other, I think we met at a, a conference in Trondheim, Norway. Um, you know, which is you. Yeah. <laughs> remember that yeah. conference? Yeah, ten years ago, twelve years ago, I don't know, but it was. But it was you know, um, conversation with a guy from a university I was not familiar with. Um, you know, you were from CEU. I didn't know the place. Um, you asked me questions. You were interested in how North American institutions do this work because we've been doing it a long time. But I was interested in sort of how that looked to you as somebody who didn't have to account for 100 years of tradition and make sure you don't change this and don't change that because somebody will become angry. Um, you know, we have to deal with that. Um, you had a, you had more flexibility maybe or more freedom. So, so in terms of, you know, what I, what I call it a mentoring relationship, I don't know, but informal knowledge transfer between people who are in the same role at a different institution or a similar role, absolutely. And I also think that if you become a mentor to somebody or you serve in that capacity, if you're doing it right, you, you learn from them. So you're supposed to be the expert or the old person who has all this knowledge. Um, but because of the questions that are being asked, because of the way that the conversations go. Uh, mentors shouldn't stop learning either, and I definitely learn a lot from uh, people who, on paper, look like maybe they're less experienced or, or less accomplished or less knowledgeable or less professional, you know, but in reality have knowledge and information and insight that I don't have and that I want to be open to. The last thing I'll say is that I, I, the interesting thing about mentors is that sometimes you don't know when you have a mentor until later. Um, and I can think of examples in my career where I had interactions with a senior person or somebody um, you know, who I might not be my own supervisor or boss, but somebody who I work with. And years later, I look back on that interaction and relationship and realize that I was being mentored without me realizing it, or maybe without them realizing it, um, you know, but that you do learn things that you don't realize you've learned until you need that thing to do your job. And um, you have an aha moment and you say, wow, 10 years ago I had a conversation with that person. Now I know what they were talking about. And uh, that at the time, it's not always obvious you're in that kind of a learning role, but later you realize it. And I think that's important to be open to. Yeah. Can I, can I not agree. I think it's a wonderful um, way to put it. Um, now, let's us shift to um, the way alumni relations kind of 
evolving as a professional area. And many of you refer to the fact that in your institutions and in your careers, Ellen Relations has played a particular role and you have a wider responsibility at some points. But if you would look into this, especially for European institutions, somehow probably it's more sensitive, um, whether you get enough leadership support, where the senior leadership, and many of you have been in the role of, you know, this one person, you know, in charge of everything, or you've been in vice president or vice rector positions, whether alumni relations from perspective of where you are now, where you've been, has been recognized as a field. So there is no such, a, you know, tremendous pressure to constantly prove that it's not only it's important for your institution, but also common understanding that it's, it's an important part of edu higher educational fabric and there is no question we should have it and there is no need to fight for each and every dollar or year or ruble in the budget to keep it operational so if about this kind of legitimacy of alumni relations as a professional area um phil could you just put a few words about that I think I, I, everybody I think thinks I, in North America. <laughs> yeah, everybody thinks that in North America that, that all institutions have uh, fully developed uh, alumni relations development programs, and it, you know, and are, ter are, are very very successful. Uh, I have been on at work for institutions where that has not been the case, where. Uh, uh, as, a, as the first director of alumni relations at my undergraduate college, um, I had to not. I had to prove that the that we needed to exist as a profession in order to help advance the institution. But it had to be in the context of what the strategy was going to be for that institution. What were we going to do with alumni relations? Was it going to be for? Um, to show that, that our alumni were very successful as a marketing tool? Was it to show that um, we were going to raise money from our alumni? What was it to, to be? Because then you had to convince the decision makers that what you were doing in alumni relations was going to contribute to the overall success of the institution. From that, I learned, and, and let me just go back to say that uh, I was an alumni director in the mid 80s and uh, at a, a regional public institution. And what was happening at that time, and there's a parallel here to what is happening in Europe. What was happening at that time is the state governments in the United States were withdrawing uh, public support or financial support to colleges and universities. As a result, the colleges had to start to look at other ways of attracting resources. Alumni started to become a natural um, outlet for that, not just as people to raise money from, but to, as a way to show the success of the organization that we, we did what we said we were gonna do. We were very mission driven and very mission specific. The same thing has happened in Europe starting around the late 90s, early 2000s, where the, the um, the national governments started to withdraw uh, support. And as a result, the same phenomena happened where uh, organizations, alumni associations needed to start to come along so that people could do the same thing in those institutions. As I became um, higher ranked, if you will, within organizations, it became easier, frankly, for those, organiza those alumni organizations that I was overseeing to survive and to thrive because I was more of the decision maker as to where resources were going to go. When I became college president, there was no doubt in my mind that I wanted to have a very active alumni organization. But my predecessors at that particular institution had not seen that function in the same way. So as late as 2011, I was again in the process of starting an alumni and a development organization at that college university. So for me, um, the, the development of the profession has been very successful at certain types of organizations in the United States. But 
for many organizations, specifically the ones that I have had to uh, had the privilege of working for, we have had to. I've been on the front end of starting alumni organizations and alumni and fundraising organizations. I have never worked, frankly, for a mature alumni and fundraising organization. So, for me, I I view it as being extraordinarily important, but it 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 needs time to develop. And a lot of times, uh, I think university and college leaders get impatient. And if they don't see a return on investment at a relatively quick pace, they don't have the patience to com continue to support. I'm of the opinion that it, if you're looking at it from a fundraising perspective, it takes 25 years to develop a good donor. You're not going to have alumni come right out of school and start contributing significant amounts of money. It takes time. And in order for you to be successful 25 years from now, you have got to cultivate those relationships and maintain those relationships over that period of time. So for me, um, it, it, I think for a lot of alumni professionals, the concept is that you have to lead up, that you have to start to develop a position that shows leadership the effects that you can have if you maintain your strong alumni investments. Um, and because a lot of folks that run colleges and universities, they don't have the connection to um, alumni. They may have an understanding of alumni based on what their experiences are at the institutions that they attended. So for me, it's if we're going to develop a strong alumni profession uh, whether it be in the States or in Europe, then a lot of that has to come from the group of people who are interested in maintaining that um, profession. In other words, you have got to develop a strategy that you can convince people uh, in the organization that you have value and you are contributing to the overall success and strategy of the organization. Thank you, Phil. Zarema, is your work uh, more difficult or easier at NAS with you being so successful in alumni uh, fundraising? I, I am I'm, um, lucky, yeah? Uh, I pioneered this, and uh, I uh, uh, have some kind of academic, not academic, but administrative freedom in developing uh, this kind of uh, uh, professional uh, work. But uh, uh, I just... Mm, it's, I, I, I think that what uh, Phil mentioned, it's the same situation now there in Russia, but with the delay in several decades, you know. Now it's, it, it became more and more obvious, but not for the most of uh, leaders, for the rectors of uh, um, uh, big, large universities with huge... Uh, state uh, state government budgeting, yeah, and um, uh, money from mo from alumni from uh, from this bot bottom side of pyramid alumni uh, pyramid, yeah. Uh, it's not so important for the budget of uh, those uh, large universities, yeah. But in our case, when we're a small uh, boutique elite institution, it's very important. And not in terms of uh, uh, in, uh, mostly fundraising, but in terms of uh, giving back uh, uh, time, talent, experience, network, networking opportunities, uh, uh, connections with labor market, uh, with employment of our current students. Uh, but nevertheless, it's not so easy uh, to get some money. Uh, if you want something to do, to please ask your to fundraise among alumni. You know, uh, uh, but I think um, in case in case of uh, new economic school, when we started uh, with fundraising, uh, decades of fundraising just not asking them for money, but just uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, things for them, for alums, and um, having not material, uh, if I can say, uh, not tangible uh, things, um, um, suddenly 
it happens. Now they they are giving back, uh, and one of the slogans of our schools is um, "Learn, Earn, Return," and this return, in terms of, in in different kinds, um, uh, it, it's so important to us. And I can just show you our last uh, uh, brochure of New Economic School. This is the picture of the head of our trustees. Yeah, it's uh, our alum, uh, a young rector, uh, uh, our alum. Something had happened. Yeah, no, our rector uh, is our al alumni person. And um, also, uh, um, alums uh, play more and more important role in making in making decisions. You just ask what what can be the role of them, yeah. And um, this year, uh, rector uh, launched a new kind of committee committee of alums uh, with permanent uh, task and. Um, the aim of this committee is to help to develop school from one side and, as Andy mentioned, to uh, uh, um, help the university to develop, yeah, uh, to advance, but also to help alums to be happier in some sense, yeah? Excellent. Thank you, Zarima. Um, Andy, you're short on this one. Thank you, Serge. So I think, you know, to, to echo what, what Phil and Seremo were saying, that this is a long-term strategy, the idea that you will somehow know this year if your new alumni program is working is not really um, prudent. I, I think that it's not even a five-year proposition. And, and for donors, maybe a major gift takes 25 years of a relationship. But for engagement of other kinds, like Seremo was talking about, um, volunteerism, advocacy, ambassadorship, um, supporting students, uh, hiring students, coming and being guest lecturers in classrooms, um, recruiting new students to enroll in the school. These kinds of roles that alumni play are a long-term investment in the success of the institution and the audience. I, I think there are two things I've uh, repeated uh, at times when I thought maybe that alumni were being ignored by institution leaders. One is to remember that the alumni audience at, at every institution is the largest single constituency that the institution has. You have, you know, may, you might have uh, a lot of, unless you're a very, very new institution, you probably have many times more alumni than students right now. You have many times more alumni than you have instructors or professors or researchers. There are many more alumni than there are staff members and managers in the institution. So this is a giant audience that is connected to your institution. And the second thing is that they're connected forever. Once you become a graduate, you are always an alumnus of that institution. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the only permanent and the largest audience the institution has. And you ignore that resource at your own peril and risk. I do think that um, the North American model, which people think of immediately, is alumni as uh, financial donors who give money. But it's also important to remember that alumni can help the institution by supporting the success of today's students um, as mentors, as advisors, as recruiters, um, as uh, coaches, as instructors, and that that helps the institution succeed. And it creates new alumni who, in turn, are grateful that they have uh, had this opportunity. Well, guys, it's. Um, um, I have a few more dozens of questions to you, including, you know, what's future uh, might look like for us, for our profession in the few, uh, you know, in few years from now. But the one hour is short time, and then uh, I'm sure our viewers have enjoyed um, this wonderful conversation and time with you. For me, it's of course. Uh, was just one second. And uh, I hope that how many people were able to see this um, uh, episode now or will see it's recorded in the future. I hope many of you um, and many of them, uh, all of us would have a chance to ask this question, who do I want to be? And whether it's alumni relations profession or high education in general, 
I think um, it's it's really secondary, perhaps. But um, I really thank you so much for a wonderful contribution, for conversation, for your loyalty, commitment to um, higher education. And um, it's been a pleasure to be with you many years. And it was, um, as I said, just one minute for me during this one hour. I think we're, it's like eight o'clock my time it must be um must be um kind of close to the end of the story for you guys too so again thank you so much um, um has been great to see you all guys um, and i promise whether it's on high ed live whether it's on any other platform promise to have one hour at least interview with each of you separately and dig in <laughs> in your knowledge and uh, wisdom and commitment and uh, all your wonderful, you know, uh, skills that you have. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you so much. Have a good day in um, Florida and in, uh, in, in Oregon, right? Oregon. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank, Thank you, care, guys. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. Good, good night. night. Good night.